Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to attack vectors and risks in Domain 3 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the fourth of seven videos for Domain 3. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are just a smidge of our complete CCSP masterclass. There are a wide variety of attack vectors that you need to be aware of if you want to keep your cloud environments secure. And we're going to go through them now. A bunch of these attack vectors are not unique to the cloud. These are attack vectors that we have in any existing data center or on-prem environment and in the cloud. So most of these next ones that we're going to go through are not going to be anything new to you. Denial of service attacks prevent users from being able to access services. A common example is a DDoS attack, a distributed denial of service attack, which involves a malicious flood of traffic overwhelming a service, preventing legitimate users from accessing the service. Malware is malicious software that's designed to harm, exploit, or allow unauthorized access to a computer system or network. Things like viruses, worms, Trojan, ransomware, logic bombs, these are all examples of malware. Some system vulnerabilities are the same in the cloud as they are under traditional environments. If you run Windows on a cloud-based VM, the OS itself has the same vulnerabilities as running Windows on your own hardware. So these are some of the system vulnerabilities that we need to think about. Cloud services are susceptible to common web application vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, and buffer overflows. We need to design our cloud services carefully using techniques like input validation to mitigate the risks stemming from these issues. And by the way, we'll talk about cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, and SQL injection, and even buffer for overflows in much more detail in a later mind map. Malicious insiders are employees, contractors, or other internal individuals that can cause harm to the organization and its systems. They pose a substantial threat because they already have access, or they may have access to sensitive data and systems. And they may have access to certain critical systems and know where the sensitive data is stored and how to cause particular harm to the organization. So this is why malicious insiders are of particular concern. Social engineering involves manipulating people into doing things that they shouldn't do. Phishing emails that trick people into handing over their passwords or financial details are a common example of social engineering. Another emerging threat is AI voice cloning which an attacker can leverage in attacks such as impersonating your boss to trick you into making a fraudulent funds transfer because you think you're getting a message from your boss. Advanced Persistent Threats, APTs, are highly skilled and well-funded attackers that infiltrate networks. They generally take a low and slow approach, penetrating the network quietly and trying to stay undetected for a long period of time. Bit by bit, they try to expand their access and elevate their privileges to steal sensitive data or cause other problems without being detected. APTs are particularly difficult to detect and can cause a lot of major havoc because these are attacks by very skilled, very determined attackers. Now let's dive into a bunch of attack vectors that are specific to the cloud. And you obviously should pay particular attention here to these ones. Organizations are responsible for approaching any cloud venture with due diligence. They need to understand the risks and opportunities and take sufficient measures to limit the downsides. Put simply, if a customer jumps headfirst into the cloud without sufficiently thinking about things like interoperability, portability, reversibility, and minimizing vendor lock-in, then that customer is going to have a bad time. It's crucial to think through the decision to move to the cloud carefully and pick a provider that best meets the needs of the organization. So do your due diligence. That's the risk here, not doing your due diligence. Guest escape is a virtual machine security breach where an attacker breaks out of their VM to access the hypervisor or other VMs on the same host. VM hopping, sometimes also called VM jumping, is a security exploit where an attacker accesses one virtual machine in order to attack another virtual machine hosted on the same physical machine. So the subtle difference between guest escape and VM hopping is that guest escape is where the att attacker breaks out of their VM potentially into the hypervisor or other VMs. And a subset of that is VM hopping. VM hopping specifically is just where the attacker breaks out of their VM into an adjacent VM. 
So that's VM hopping. Hyperjacking involves an attacker taking control of an existing hypervisor. So they jacked the hypervisor. This type of attack has absolutely occurred in the wild. Hyperstack attacks, on the other hand, are much more rare as they would be incredibly difficult to pull off, but they could put an organization at real risk. What a hyper stack attack is, is where an attacker removes an existing hypervisor and replaces it with their own malicious hypervisor, giving them obvious total control over running the hypervisor. APIs, as we've talked about, are used extensively in the cloud. APIs are the prominent, predominant way that everything in the cloud is controlled. So if we have insufficient access control or encryption that leads to unauthorized usage or access of these APIs, it can lead to some serious security issues because essentially everything in the cloud is controlled through APIs. Related to the provider's infrastructure, it's incredibly important for cloud providers to secure their un underlying infrastructure. You should only use a provider that can demonstrate appropriate security which is often done through third-party audit reports that we'll talk about later. If your cloud provider's infrastructure is not secure, there is no way you can securely run your virtualized systems on top of it. So this is why you need to think about the risks associated with your provider's infrastructure. Particularly in public clouds, customers are sharing the same underlying physical hardware and systems. While this is a core aspect of how the cloud can bring down costs, it also means that if an attacker finds a vulnerability in the services of one customer, then that vulnerability could exist in many other customers sharing the services. So this is the risk of shared technology. Account hijacking is a major risk in cloud environments, particularly for privileged accounts that have access to the management plane. The management plane, as we talked about in a previous mind map, controls so much of the overall service that a compromise at this level is essentially game over in terms of security. So if someone were to gain access to the root account of your customer management plane, you're done from a security perspective. All right, now let's move on to a whole list of risks that are common and then we'll get into some that are specific to the cloud. So let's start with the common risks. Data loss involves data becoming corrupted, deleted, or made unreadable. A data breach is when information is stolen or taken from a system without the knowledge or authorization of the system owner. Integrity is a critical property that we want for our important data. It essentially means that it hasn't been tampered with or manipulated. Compliance is an important yet challenging aspect of working in the cloud. The flexible and international nature of cloud services makes it easy to store or process data in many different countries. But this could put your organization at risk. We must abide by the regulations of the countries that our organizations operate in. And sometimes there may be restrictions about what you can collect and store that will vary significantly from jurisdiction country to country. The following risks I'm now going to discuss are more specific to the cloud. So obviously pay a little more attention here. VM sprawl. In the cloud, it's incredibly easy to spin up new virtual machines or other infrastructure. This Ease can lead to deploying too much infrastructure and forgetting about them. If you forget about some VMs that are deployed, you will likely neglect to patch them and appropriately maintain their security, which could lead to insecure systems and ways for the baddies to break into your infrastructure. So, so the basic idea with VM sprawl is because it's so easy to create cloud infrastructure, you might sometimes forget about some of that infrastructure, not properly secure it, and that becomes the weakness in your environment. Let's now talk about sensitive data within a VM. When a VM is running, it often has a bunch of security controls protecting it, such as a host-based IDS, anti-malware, DLP tool, et cetera, et cetera. When we suspend a VM, essentially what we're doing is turning that system into a file, and none of these security controls are gonna be running anymore. This puts sensitive data at risk unless you place other security controls on the VM file, such as encryption. So when you suspend a VM, turning into a file, you have to think about the security of that file. A dormant VM won't get patched or typically won't be patched during a patching lifecycle, and this can lead to instant on gaps. So what is an instant on gap? When you first power on a dormant VM, it may be missing patches, which means that it could have a number of vulnerabilities. An instant on gap is the period of vulnerability in between waking up the VM and getting it patched and secured and locked down. 
there are two major ways of dealing with instant on gaps. The first approach is that as part of your patch management process, remember to wake up and patch all dormant VMs during a patch cycle. But it's hard to do this and not miss some VM somewhere. And so the second more common way of dealing with instant on gaps is to use quarantine. When you wake up a dormant VM, it is immediately put in quarantine and blocked from accessing most of the internal network and especially the internet, thus vastly reducing the chance that it could be potentially compromised before you get a chance to patch it. Once the VM is patched and brought in compliance with the latest configuration requirements, it can then be removed from quarantine and put back on the regular network. So that's the more common way of dealing with instant on gaps is to use quarantine. Resource exhaustion is a risk that can impact certain cloud setups. As an example, if you have a VM sharing a compute node with another VM that is getting hammered by a DDoS attack, your VM may be affected by this. Your VM may not be able to access the resources it needs to effectively complete its tasks. So this is a, the risk of resource exhaustion. The cloud does have a lot of resources, but they are not limitless. So you may run into resource exhaustion issues. Hypervisors have full visibility into everything that a VM does. So the risk here is that the security of the hypervisor is absolutely critical. If the hypervisor is compromised, then so are all of the VMs running on top of it. So the risk here is related to hypervisor security. Data commingling. Public clouds involve customers sharing the same underlying physical hardware. Although cloud providers should and do have logical isolation in place, there is a chance for this to fail and for customers to be able to access the data of another customer. This is one reason why you should be really careful about storing highly sensitive data in the public cloud because your data is inherently commingled with other customers' data. And the final one here, inter-VM communication and blind spots. So what is blind spot? One example of a blind spot is when you have two VMs communicating with each other that are on the same hypervisor. If your IDS is attached to a switch on your software-defined network, then the VMs won't usually bother routing their traffic out to your IDS. Instead, they'll just communicate directly through the hypervisor, meaning that your IDS will be blind, will be able to see the traffic. So the risk here is you will inevitably have these sorts of blind spots in the cloud, right? Inter-VM communication being an example. And you need to identify these blind spots and figure out how to mitigate this risk. And there you go. That's an overview of attack vectors and risks within Domain 3, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the CCSP exam.